Cheap commercial drones have been used in Ukraine since the start of the war. Those were usually remotely operated quadcopters, carrying a small shaped charge or a grenade, usually over flying a target and dropping its lethal load. But what was once in 2022 a nuisance and a cottage industry, by 2023 it quickly transformed into something much bigger and more lethal. Today, agile first-person view quadcopters have become the norm in Ukraine, operated as loitering guided missiles in a way to threaten even the smallest of targets, sometimes just individual soldiers, and their numbers are rising at a breakneck pace. Watch our video to learn how these FPV drones may change the nature of warfare. First up, wanna surprise someone with a weird t-shirt? Or just become a proud wearer of our bad motherfucker bink of tea? We've also got other bink of classic teas to choose from, so give them all a look and check out our link below the video description. On to our video now. Ukraine's Mikhail Fedorov estimated this past September that the number of drones at the front lines are currently at tens of thousands, with most of that number being FPV drones, or first-person view drones. Due to their mass usage, that means that every day a thousand or more drones are expended and thousands more take their place. So what is a first-person view drone? Most often, an FPV acronym for a drone means its pilot navigates solely using the drone's onboard camera, often done via display screen for a virtual reality system. At times, to lower costs, that's really just a smartphone in a headset. There are other quadcopters and commercial-grade drones, but those use sensors and software to firmly stabilize them. While those two provide a camera feed, they're much slower and are usually controlled via GPS navigation map. Such drones are controlled like one would control a remote control model car, not fully relying on first-person view. When you see footage of a quadcopter hovering over a trench or a vehicle and then releasing a small bomb, that's not an FPV drone. FPV drones are usually racing drones, made for speed and quick maneuvers. They are generally smaller and can't fly as far, but they can be used as kamikaze weapons, essentially guided missiles where the human operator, looking at the screen, purposefully rams the drone into a target. Typical ranges are up to 10 kilometers or 6 miles, but some models do go over 10 miles or 16 kilometers. Speeds reached are generally well over 100 kilometers per hour, sometimes approaching even 200. That's up to 120 miles per hour. In Ukraine, some such drones are purpose-built weapons, essentially missiles but most are hobbyist-class racing drones improvised to carry small loads. Due to their racing design heritage, they're usually flush with excess engine power, so they can still be fairly agile while carrying a small payload. For most, carrying a half a kilo of payload shows no significant impact on their controllability. The US Army hand grenade weighs 100 grams less than that. Simple RPG-7 warhead, good against lightly armored vehicles, weighs around a kilo still quite manageable for a fair number of off-the-shelf commercial racing drones. According to the Ukrainian Ministry of Digital Development, every third such drone hits its target. Best of all, such drones are quite cheap. This August Ukraine raised 6.4 million dollars to buy 10,000 FPV drones. That's 640 dollars per drone. The downside is that it takes longer to learn to fly them compared to the conventionally stabilized quadcopters which are nowadays more used for recon and to guide artillery strikes and FPV drone strikes. Indeed, without guidance, a lone FPV operator would not be nearly as useful. In Ukraine, FPV drones typically fly teamed up with other drones with better cameras. When the target is geolocated, the FPV drone swoops onto it. FPV drones can also be loitering munitions. They can run circles around their targets if need be, they can go through windows and pick the best routes of attack, or even pinpoint the most vulnerable parts of targets. That all applies if their operators have been well trained, of course. Such agility comes from the drone operator being free to actually fly the drone without so much stabilization aid, typical for other quadcopters. Learning to operate FPV drones thus takes two to four weeks. Victory Drones Project's Ms. Berlinska said highly motivated individuals can become good FPV operators in 30 days. Not surprisingly, most talented drone pilots have proved to be people with PlayStation experience. 
students start their training via computer simulators before moving to field exercises, where they strike fridge-sized remote control vehicles which move at 10 miles per hour. Allegedly, when Russia started its assault in Avdivka, Ukraine managed to hit 100 guns and over 160 various armored vehicles in a single week in October, using FPV drones. Ukraine publishes their claims of Russian equipment destroyed, including how many were destroyed using drones. For October, they claimed Ukraine used drones to destroy 37% of Russian tanks, 30% of other armored vehicles and 49% of artillery pieces. But both sides are now using FPV drones in massive numbers. So many drones requires many drone pilots. Within 10 months, Ukrainian Victory Drones project graduated 1,000 FPV drone pilots. Kruk Drone School added another 800 pilots. Ms. Berlinska of Victory Drones said Ukraine needs some 10,000 FPV drone pilots. Binkov estimates that right now there's likely less than a third of that number available. But even with those low number of pilots, there may be a deficiency of actual drones. Taras Kmut, head of Ukraine's largest military procurement charity, said there are more FPV pilots than the capacity to give them enough drones to work with. Still, they're becoming ubiquitous. Oleg Senstov is platoon commander in the 47th Brigade, which was fighting at Robotino during Ukraine's summer offensive, before being sent to Avdivka in late October. In a recent Washington Post article, he said initially the biggest issue was vast minefields, but now it's FPV drones. According to him, FPV drones hit precisely and can disable a Bradley fighting vehicle, or even destroy it. Furthermore, in the article, Ukrainian military officials said the ubiquity and lethality of various types of drones used by both sides has been the biggest factor preventing either side from gaining significant ground. Allegedly, equipment that appears on the very front line has a lifespan of one minute. That may be a hyperbole, but even if the reality is 10 times better, it still paints a picture of losses being unsustainable. So, how to defend from such drones? In very early 2022, Ukraine had decent success using regular quadcopters and expensive military drones like the Bayraktar. But as months went by, Russian defenses improved. By summer of 2022, 90% of drones Ukraine had at the start of the war were lost. Average life expectancy of a regular quadcopter was three flights. Fixed-wing UAVs flew for six flights before their demise. That's all according to a Royal United Services Institute report dated this May, with enemy signals jamming being the biggest factor in drone losses. That continued into 2023, with the Royal Services Institute claiming 10,000 Ukrainian drones are lost every month, with jamming again being a critical factor in said numbers. The same report said Russian wide area signal jamming systems were positioned so there is a system for every 10 kilometers of the front. That was back in early 2023. Those are large, powerful jammers which can neutralize unprotected communications from dozens of miles away. Such systems can in theory be very lethal against mass drone attacks. If they are plentiful enough, they may jam whole swaths of frequencies at once. But such an approach has issues. Such jamming means no one can use those frequencies, so friendly comms are also jammed. Russia suffered exactly those issues in 2022, when its jammers accidentally jammed its own equipment. Furthermore, such powerful jammers are easy to track electronically when they are turned on, and the enemy may send capable and expensive guided munitions after them. So once a hole in the jamming coverage is made, then the FPV drones can start swooping in. Today, what we're also seeing in videos from the front lines is ever greater use of small jammers that can fit in a backpack, which are often placed on individual vehicles. An example of that is the Russian Volnorez jammer. Russian sources claim it can jam signals from over 600 meters away. That would allow one jammer to cover all the vehicles in a platoon. But there have been instances where drones still manage to hit vehicles with jammers on board. Drones in general get controlled by radio frequency signals. Their navigation can also be aided by GPS, which is also a type of a radio signal. More expensive military-grade drones use jamming protection. With such drones, generally, if the jamming signal and the GPS signal come from the opposite directions into the drone, jamming doesn't work well. Agile frequency changes can also fool simple jammers. 
But drones made to be as cheap as possible, like FPV drones and other commercial quadcopters, generally don't feature anti-jamming hardware. Small jammers can fool some of them. Large expensive jammers can try to suffocate the controller of the repeater source directly. That being said, there has been a slow influx of more complex drones, custom made to withstand some jamming. For example, Russians had used simple signal jammers on some vehicles. Those weren't really designed against drones switching their control frequency, so more advanced drones were observed hitting vehicles equipped with such jammers. However, individual vehicle level jamming systems are more expensive than an FPV drone, and they're a whole new category in warfare. Just as in early 2022 FPV drones were very little used, individual vehicle jamming systems were used even less, as there was no need for those. Since FPV drone usage skyrocketed into tens of thousands per month, one can expect jammer usage to increase. That is happening, but it will take time to scale up and it will always lag behind the drone production. FPV drones have a massive commercial drone industry base behind them, lowering their costs. Compact jammers are basically a military spec product and will likely not be able to compete with the price and availability. As we said, right now, due to jamming, pilot errors and other factors, Ukraine enjoys one FPV drone hitting a target for every three drones attempting it. Hitting a target and damaging it is, however, not the same. Cope cages, or more properly said slat armor over vehicles, helped initially against quadcopters dropping bombs from above. But against a well-trained FPV drone operator who approaches from the sides and chooses the most vulnerable part of a vehicle, such armor is not so effective. What we may see is more and more elaborate slat armor around vehicles, in a way that has already started happening. New Russian T-90M tanks have been spotted with quite elaborate slat armor extending well past just the turret and covering even the engine from some angles. Now, all that passive defense is not going to stop FPV drones. It may help lower the casualties, but the only way to really fight them is wide area jamming, with expensive jammers being able to cover many frequencies at once. And to do that, the defender will need quite a bit of money and production investment over the FPV user. That really goes beyond the war in Ukraine. The US and China may be able to afford such defenses in the future against third parties, but probably not against each other. The Pentagon's acquisition chief, Bill Laplante, already acknowledged the US needs to seriously increase the industrial base for anti-drone defenses, saying it needs to go up roughly by an order of magnitude. Large systems such as militaries adopt slowly, which is why FPV drones took them by surprise. This spring, US military instructors did not teach Ukrainian troops anything about drone usage and defenses. It was only months later, after Ukraine complained the US Army does not understand the realities of today's battlefield, that the US Army instructors started adding such courses. Indeed, one Ukrainian official said that the Western sourced vehicles which made sense in 2022 simply do not work anymore in 2023, due to a shift in battlefield doctrines and technology. Also, at a certain point in this war, jamming may not be an option against some drones. When targeting will be able to be handed over to the AI and when AI will do the piloting, then drones will become impervious to jamming. As long as handing over of the drone happens outside jamming range, the drone will become self-sufficient and simply swoop onto its target. Such AI-assisted targeting is already used in the military, but so far it's been relegated to fairly pricey bombs and missiles. So their availability for a country like Russia was perhaps counted in the thousands. FPV drones allow superb guidance on the cheap, leading to a hundred times more weapons available. But as technology progresses, we've already seen image identification tech and AI piloting to be implemented on select cheap commercial grade drones. Ukrainian Saker Scout drone is one example of that. So just how ubiquitous and numerous are FPV drones in Ukraine? On October 25th, Ukraine's Minister for Strategic Industries said Ukraine is producing thousands of drones per month, but soon that will increase to tens of thousands. Those were likely old numbers even then. From October to December, just one Ukrainian company, TAF Drones, raised its monthly output from 6 to 12,000 drones. That's according to the company's chief, Yakovenko. 
adding other Ukrainian companies and foreign drone purchases, it's quite likely that, as of this moment, Ukraine is indeed making a few tens of thousands of drones per month. Back in August, one Ukrainian drone pilot claimed Russia used 40,000 FPV drones per month back then. In December, drone space founder Maxim Sheremet raised eyebrows when he said Ukraine produces 50,000 FPV drones per month and that Russians produce six times more, or 300,000 per month. Now that may or may not be an informed statement, it may be a hyperbole, but even if it's not quite true today, it may very well become true within mere months. The pace of FPV drone usage in Ukraine is skyrocketing on both sides. Yubov Shipovic said there are some 200 drone manufacturers in Ukraine right now. Not all are making FPV drones, of course, but they provide only 15% of the army's total needs, and ideally 200,000 FPV drones would be needed each month. At such numbers, 200 or 300,000 per month, FPV drones will have matched 155mm artillery usage, which is substantial. During its summer offensive, Ukraine was firing 6,000 such high-caliber artillery rounds per day, or 180,000 per month. Russian artillery usage has allegedly dropped to some 20,000 per day for all calibers throughout most of 2023. That's 600,000 rounds. Not really far off of what Russian FPV drone production may reach soon, if it's already at 300,000. The thing is, FPV drones became dirt cheap. Ukrainian businessman Alex Yakovenko first assembled drones from Chinese components, with costs reaching $700. But after several months, the cost of components went down to $250. Overall, an average FPV drone used in Ukraine is thought to cost $600 to $700 when labor is included. When taking into account the fact one-third of FPV drones do not hit their target, the cost of a hit climbs to some $2,000. Of course, that doesn't involve logistics costs, nor operator costs. But Forbes did a comparison with other weapon system types. And while industrial-grade drones were also fairly cheap to hit, more complex weapons proved to be far too expensive to use. With simple mortar and artillery rounds being 20 times more expensive, and advanced military-grade kamikaze drones and GPS-guided artillery rounds coming in at being 50 times more expensive. That comparison is not fully fair as it compared the life cycle cost of weapons. And of course, an artillery gun costs a lot to operate over the years. It provides other uses as well. But it also eats up much more logistics and requires many more people to run it. While a mortar round costs just a few hundred dollars, many need to be expended to achieve a hit. Also, an FPV drone hit is not gonna do the same amount of damage as a precise hit by a guided artillery round. Still, the difference in cost efficiency remains massive. The front line from Zaporizhia in the west to the border with Russia in the north is roughly 500 kilometers long. Imagine now using 50 to 300,000 drones per month, that's 3 to 20 drones per kilometer of the front per day. And with a few thousand drone operators available to Ukraine, it's likely 15 to 20 drones are used per operator per day with possibly five or more hits achieved per operator each day. We're talking about possibly 10,000 guided hits per month for Ukraine, plausibly even more for Russia. Guided hits on a very tactical level, at times against individual troops. Let that sink in. Warfare has never been that efficient at said level. Usually it was huge artillery barrages, 10 million various shells used, hundreds of millions of bullets used in a few years of a war. Warfare is now changing. While drones as carriers of individual munitions, expensive in aggregate as a whole system, were too early touted as game changers in warfare, Binkov does believe tiny cheap kamikaze drones do have the potential to change warfare forever. Not overnight, and not in all domains of course. A war over the sea would right now likely see fewer such drones. But eventually, and especially once AI becomes cheap enough, such self-guiding kamikaze drones will essentially become the weapons on the battlefield. They will meld into the doomsday prophecies of AI-controlled drone swarms, and they will doctrinally become indistinguishable from missiles. Some will keep cheap propulsion, while others will start resembling missiles more. 
According to the New York Times, referring to official Russian customs data, Russia imported $14 million worth of drone parts in 2022. Ukraine imported less than a million worth of similar parts. The West isn't yet recognizing the importance of FPV drones and isn't scaling up their production, while Russia and Ukraine are. Furthermore, most of the commercial drone market is controlled by China. China can much more easily and more quickly ramp up production of drone components, and Russia is likely to profit from that more than Ukraine, as has been the case from the start of the war. As of September 1st, China's new rules forbidding export of certain classes of drones have hurt Ukraine more than Russia, as Russian industry has better means of producing drones from Chinese subcomponents compared to Ukraine. The whole commercial drone market has likely sold over 10 million drones in 2021, before the war started. Today the craze for drones and the war may have easily doubled that. FPV drones are here to stay, and potentially help decide the war in Ukraine. They're obviously not yet at the point where every soldier can use them, but we showed how their use skyrocketed in mere months. When one wonders how FPV drones became crucial, it will be obvious it was the war in Ukraine that started this new era. Going beyond that, their use may influence many aspects of warfare, especially once a person's view is taken out of the equation, replaced by AI. We may eventually see those drones impact different armor configuration for vehicles, and different doctrine of using vehicles. Currently the US Army envisions a future with a few unmanned vehicles going in front of one manned vehicle but that thinking may already be outdated. Pentagon's replicator program, which tries to leverage commercial drone industry, shows the US is aware of the tectonic shift incoming. But how quickly will various countries around the world adapt to the new technology remains to be seen. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.